So I'm pretty surprised that I haven't talked about recursion throughout all my Julia programming or even my Fortran programming. It's a topic that I'm going to touch on a little bit here, and I'm also going to go into the debugger that can help with debugging your recursive code, but also can help with other instances if you don't like using print statements or if print statements aren't working out. So we're going to do a high level discussion of what is a recursive program. I'm going to go through an example, and then we're going to go through a couple other examples of how a debugger can help with them. And then also look at the debugger and some of its documentation, all the usual stuff I usually do. If you appreciate this content, please give this video a like and subscribe and let's go into recursion. Now, before we go into debugging recursion, I'm going to give a little bit of a high level discussion of what recursion is. So we're going to do this first example. And after that, then we'll look at the documentation for the debugger that you see up here called using debugger. First, let's look at what recursion is. Now, the, the main idea for recursion is you are feeding the function itself. So if you look in this function rec sum, so that's recursive sum, you can see that I'm actually returning the function itself. And this is where it gets weird. The topic that's pretty difficult to understand if you're first being introduced into computer science, but it's something that's necessary for you understanding how the stack works and, and memory. And there, there are cool little puzzles to figure out how to break down these big problems into smaller problems, which is the, the idea for recursion. So there's two main two main things that you usually need for a recursive program. You have a thing called a base case, and then you have the recursive call. Now, the simple simplest example is an if else statement, and that's how it usually gets handled in a recursive call. So you can see here if x equals equals zero. So if x is zero, then we're just returning itself. And then the recursive call, essentially when x is not zero, it does this call here. Now you can see if this base case didn't exist, okay, so like if we have an X, we have five, which is what I'm doing in the main program. Five would get inserted into here. We would do five plus recursive sum of five minus one. So five plus recursive sum of four. And then this would call this function again, and it would go here and it would return four plus recursive sum of four minus one. So that would be three. And now keep on going. But because we don't have this base case, this x equals zero, it would continue on infinitely. So that's the point of the base case. It's supposed to be the stopping case for whatever the program is doing that gets down to its most minimal, smallest example of, of your, your big problem. And then it returns everything back and then you get an answer. Now, looking at the recursive call itself, you can see, like once again, going back to five, you would do five plus recursive sum of four. Well, okay, so now if we have recursive sum of four, What's it going to do here? I'm going to get read this so it's not zero. So it's going to do this and it's going to return four plus recursive sum of three. And to keep on doing that, so you can see it's going five plus four plus three plus two plus one, and it gets to zero. And zero is just going to return zero. So then it gets returned that entire statement of five plus four plus three plus two plus one plus zero. And it adds it all up because that's what this function is supposed to do. And four or five, that would be 15. So just to show how this works, if I do a simple print line in this recursive sum, run this, you can see it's printing out all those, those different x's that are coming out. First we stuck in five, and then it gets down to here, gives it four, so it's printing out four, it goes back again, prints out three, and two, and it going all back, and then you add all these numbers back together and you get 15. Okay, so that's recursion, that's a high level discussion. If you guys want me to do a deeper dive on recursion, because I know recursion is a pretty tough subject for, especially if you're learning coding right now, we can do that. I can go into more examples, but hopefully these examples can help you. So the main reason why I'm talking about the debugger here is usually when we're trying to debug code, we just put print lines, right? You put a flag here, but what's the output coming out there? And usually that's sufficient. Now in recursion, because you can see you're calling the function again, the the print lines tend to get mixed up a lot. So I have here, it's called fib. This is the Fibonacci. And if you know the Fibonacci, you can already see that this is wrong right now. Now, if I try to do a print line of the Fibonacci, like, okay, I'm gonna print out the X and see what's being outputted in each iteration, all that. Okay, uh, I don't know what this is, right? You have, uh, it's kind of difficult to interpret this. You can maybe do print lines of the specific fib x minus three and or x minus two, maybe that can differentiate better. The point is, is that especially with larger, more complicated recursion programs, print lines sometimes just don't cut it. And you need to see more what's going on to the math. 
Now, once again, these are simple examples, but it's more to show that if you had a really complex example, a uh, debugger can help with these instances. So let's look at the documentation for the debugger, and then we'll actually start using it. Okay, so this is just an FYI, but if you actually go to the Julia Lang website itself and you scroll down, you can see the debugger right here. So it's one of the tools, one of the essential tools that they mention. And it's kind of because of that and because I had to use it recently that I thought this would be a good topic to go into. So now actually following that link, it will lead you to the debugger over here. This is the documentation for it. So this is this GitHub page. You can see it's Julia debug, debugger.jl. So the, the cool thing about this is this is a debugger within your code. And this works a little bit differently than other debuggers. Maybe you've used the ones that are actually in uh, encoding programs. Maybe you use the ones that are actually in IDEs and you click breakpoints and you run the specific debugger and you can pause it when you want. And those, those are good too. These allow you the flexibility of putting, it, putting calls specifically in your code and Maybe if you're working on something that's more in the terminal, maybe something that's um, a bit more limited access, but you can install different packages pretty easily, then this can help with that instance. You can install using debugger with uh, their package manager, right? The REPL, you just add it. You can add it to the code that you're working with and you can hard code breakpoints and how to enter into it. And we're gonna go through that process right now. These are all the commands. If, uh, if you're trying to learn how to use this debugger, it has a lot of documentation here and a lot of other examples. I'm going to go through the recursive example because I feel like that's those are the big examples that I always have used the debugger besides now I'm more complicated code but these covers a lot of other stuff that maybe you need it for whatever you're coding for okay so when you when you're trying to use the debugger of course you have to make sure it's in your REPL so if you check here check your status I have debugger right there you have to add it to your project and then now, the simple case here is you just add the macro at enter. So that means when we run this debugger, it's gonna enter into the main program and then we're gonna start seeing the steps. So we're gonna go through how the debugger actually looks. All right, now you can see here that we are in the debugger itself and you can see that the, the text has kind of changed and now it says debug here instead of Julia. And that's, that's a sign that you're using the, de the debugger now. Now in here, it's going to start running. Now I have it where it's entering main. So it goes into here, it ran this first line and it tells you what it's about to run. So it's going to call this function and give it this input. You decide whether you're going to step over that, step into that. And those are pretty much the main two calls that you need to know, S and N. So in this case, we're trying to debug the Fibonacci function. So we want to step into, so you do an S and you step into it. And now we're inside the actual Fibonacci function. Now. We know that we inserted a five. We know that five is not less than two. So we can kind of just step over this. We don't really need to look at the math that it's doing there. And then it gets to here and we can see, okay, so it's gonna stick in five into here. So five, three, and this, this syntax is a little bit different. And you can see that this is the operation is being performed on these two numbers. It's kind of how you want to interpret it. it will be five minus three, which now, if uh, because it's such a simple example, if you know how Fibonacci works, you're supposed to have a Fibonacci of n minus two and n minus one. So right there you would see, oh, this is n minus three and that doesn't look right. So we're gonna step into that. And this is actually doing, so because we're stepping into it, it's going a little bit deeper and this is the actual math that's being performed. And we can skip over that a little bit. You can you can see that's doing subtraction of integers, so that's that's fine. It's doing another subtraction, returning two, so that's that's what we got back. So five minus two, that doesn't sound right because we did an incorrect subtraction. And now we would know, okay, so that's where my mistake is. The Q and exit out. Now, when it came to the print statement, why they got so convoluted is as you can see, it was first going into here, and so it first print out. Five, but go into here, print out what you get from this. So that'd be two, and they would do the two minus three, and that'd be negative one. But then you can also see it's calling this one here. So you have to keep track of what's being inserted, but also what's being subtracted. And it just, it gets really confusing really quickly. But okay, so we figured out, okay, so this shouldn't be minus three, this should be minus one. If we run our code again, but this time we take out the, the debugger. Now, when we rerun our Fibonacci, we get five. Okay, math is working, cool. Now looking at the last example we have here is our factorial function, which is also coded incorrectly right now. 
I run it, we can see that if we're inserting five, it goes five, three, one, and then we get 15. Now, if you know factorial, it's supposed to be one times two times three times four times five, and that's not what we got here. Instead, we got five times three, but we missed a couple factors in there. Now in here, we can actually see that the print statement does help us. We can see that five is being subtracted by two and became three, and then three subtracted by two became one, and that's what it got returned, because once it got to this base case, it just returns one back, and then it's doing all the math and gets five times three. So seeing that we already can kind of figure out our mistake. We pretty much can't figure out our mistake, right? But because we're being over the top with this now for running it, once again, we can see we have factorial. We're ins inserting five into, and because I left the print statement now, you uh, you can see it there and it's about to run print line of five. We can run next. Now you can see the output coming out. So this is the five, that print line that just outputted. Now it's going to this if statement. We know that five isn't less than one. If you wanted to check that, you just step into it and you can see the math that's going on. But we're gonna just step up over that and then we can see here oh five minus two that doesn't look right this is where our mistake is so print statements can still benefit your work along with the debugger but definitely if you're dealing with code that's super complicated these aren't super complicated Fibonacci I felt like was a good example because the print line really doesn't make sense but when you're dealing with much tougher cases, especially cases when you're dealing with memory or just different calls to different objects the debugger can really help out now here, okay, so we see we're doing five minus two. Okay, let's fix that. We do five minus one. And now we do our full print statement. We get 120, that's factorial five. That all works out. Math is working, all good fun. Okay, and that's pretty much how you use the debugger. It's, uh, it's a very nice tool and it helps out with your coding, like I said before especially if you're dealing with really complicated code. Hopefully this will be another tool to add to your repertoire of coding. Please give this video a like and subscribe. I do wanna let you guys know that I'm in the process of moving, so there probably be another week or two of hiatus because moving sucks. But once everything is settled down, then we'll be more back on track onto recording and outputting some videos. If you have any requests for what to cover in the future, feel free to comment in the sections below, tweet at me at Twitter at DJ's Office Hours, or email me at DJ's Office Hours at gmail.com. I have a couple requests already, and I, I do have them in line. Every video always takes time. I have to do research and figure out and make sure that it's good for you guys. If you've made requests, I, I am aware of them. They're in line, and uh, they will be coming out eventually. <laughs> Hope you guys learned something new, and I'll see you guys next week.